Hey, this is Derek, and listen to Skepticality, the official podcast of Skeptic Magazine, for Tuesday, May 22nd, 2012. Welcome back to another episode of Skepticality, the show that brings you news and interviews with folks from all around the world for the promotion of skepticism, critical thought, and science. As usual, I'm going to start by allowing Kim Farley to do his thing and educate all of us about the past and future of skepticism for these next couple weeks. I'm Tim Farley of whatstheharm.net and skeptools.com, and this is Skepticism Past and Future. This week in the past, we've got a speech and an article that both had unintended consequences. In the future, we've got the unintended consequences of social media posts by skeptics. This time last year, in Skepticality number 156, I related the story of a connection between parapsychologist J.B. Rhine and the famous author Arthur Conan Doyle. One connection between the two occurred 90 years ago this week, when Doyle gave two speeches on May 23rd and May 26th, 1922, in Chicago. He was on a multi-city tour to promote spiritualism. Doyle's enthusiasm for spiritualism inspired Rhine to go into parapsychology. But just a few years later, Rhine would debunk a well-known medium enraging Doyle. Doyle's promotion of spiritualism had had an unintended consequence. Another instance of an unintended consequence involved psychiatrist Wilhelm Reich, A follower of Freud, he had some very strange ideas about human sexuality. He believed it revolved around a mythical form of energy called orgone that could be collected from the atmosphere using special devices. He believed a poor sex life and lack of orgone could cause diseases like cancer. On May 26, 1947, an article titled The Strange Case of Wilhelm Reich appeared in the New Republic. It was written by Mildred Edie Brady, who was born June 3, 1906. It told the story of how Reich's ideas had been rejected by most in the profession, and yet he still sold his orgone accumulators to the public. In July of that year, the FDA would begin investigating. The investigation went on for several years and resulted in a trial and conviction almost a decade later. Reich was sent to prison in 1957 on a two-year sentence, but before that year was out, he had died in prison. Brady had intended to get his quack orgone cure off the market, but Reich's death was certainly an unintended consequence. In the future of skepticism, many skeptics use social media to communicate with each other, with purveyors of nonsense, and with the general public. Very often, these social media posts on sites such as Twitter and Facebook include a hyperlink to a piece of content along with a comment. And of course, these comments can be humorous or sarcastic. But let me warn you about some unintended consequences here. Social media has become popular and very powerful. Facebook, for instance, has over 900 million users registered. Each has the ability to promote articles and other content to their friends. The mass media, publishing, and PR industries are very aware of this. Everything is measured. You can see it for yourself on major newspaper sites, where the number of Facebook posts, Twitter retweets, and Google Pluses of a story are often proudly displayed next to it. And these numbers are definitely tracked and acted upon. So the next time you are considering a derisive post about an anti-science editorial or other piece of nonsense, think twice about where you link. 
if you link directly to the horrible content, you may be helping send a signal to the creator that it, that it is exactly what the public wants. The end result is more of the same. Instead, find a way to link somewhere else. For instance, link to a skeptic blog that has criticized the same story, but add your comment. Or if it is a news story you are linking, see if the skeptical site Doubtful News has covered it and link to their story instead of the original. Now, on the other hand, there are ways that skeptics can use this social media tracking in our favor. Social media activity is also measured by the major search engines. In January, Google rolled out an enhancement they call Search Plus Your World that takes your social connections on Google Plus into account when you use Google Search. Just last week, Microsoft's Bing search engine unveiled a similar enhancement that uses Facebook and other connections to show related results to your search. These social signals can make results appear in searches for your friends that would not normally appear. Do you have family, friends, or acquaintances who could use some skepticism from time to time? Of course you do. We all do. But one must take care not to be too pushy with the skeptical message, or it's, you can quickly wear out your welcome. So here's a clever alternative. Instead of pushing skeptical articles on your friends, instead make sure you click the Facebook Like and Google Plus One buttons for good, well-written skeptical content that relates to areas that you think your friends might need help in. By doing so, and by maintaining your social media connections to your non-skeptical friends, you might just be able to catch them the next time they use a search engine to research that same topic. And that's an intended consequence that might be quite powerful. This brings us to the end of another edition of Skepticism Past and Future. Links to additional material are in the show notes, and follow me on Twitter or Facebook under the name Krelnik, K-R-E-L-N-I-K, for a daily fact from skepticism's past and ongoing news of skepticism's future. Thanks once again, Tim. As I'm recording this, this is the end of May, which means it's ever closer to the upcoming Skeptics Big Bash, The Amazing Meeting. If you're going to be there, make sure to come and see the cool workshop that Tim has put together for the event this year. There's a good chance that either me or Swoopy or both of us will be there at that event this time around. Somebody else I often run into while enjoying myself at The Amazing Meeting is Bob Carroll. And he happens to have yet another entry from his work over at The Skeptics Dictionary. This is Bob Carroll, creator of the Skeptics Dictionary and the blog Unnatural Acts That Can Improve Your Thinking. Welcome to another episode of Unnatural Virtue. In this and future episodes, I'll be offering some brief comments on topics in critical thinking, skepticism, and science. Today's topic is confabulation. Have you ever told a story that you embellished by putting yourself at the center when you knew that you weren't even there? Or have you ever been absolutely sure you remembered something correctly, only to be shown incontrovertible evidence that your memory was wrong? No, of course not. But you probably know or have heard of somebody else who juiced up a story with made-up details, or whose confidence in his memory was shown to be undeserved by evidence showing his memory was false. Confabulation is an unconscious process of creating a narrative that is believed to be true by the narrator, but is demonstrably false. The term is popular in psychiatric circles to describe narratives of patients with brain damage or a psychiatric disorder who make statements about what they perceive or remember that are known to be either completely fictional or in great part fantasy, but are believed to be true by the patient. Neurologist Oliver Sacks writes of a patient with a brain disorder that prevented him from forming new memories. Even though Mr. Thompson could not remember who Sacks was, each time Sacks visited him, he created a fictional narrative about their previous encounters. Sometimes Sachs was a butcher that Thompson knew when he worked as a grocer. A few minutes later, he'd recognize Sachs as a customer and create a new fictional narrative. 
Sachs described Thompson's confabulations as an attempt to make meaning out of perceptions that he could only relate to events in long-term memory. You might think, poor fellow, he has to construct his memories and fill in the blank parts with stuff he makes up. Yes, he does. But so do you, and so do I. There's an overwhelming amount of scientific evidence on memory that shows memories are constructed by all of us, and that the construction is a mixture of fact and fiction. Something similar is true for perception. Our perceptions are constructions that are a mixture of sense data processed by the brain and other data that the brain supplies to fill in the blanks. Now there is a body of growing scientific research that shows confabulation is not something restricted to psychiatric patients or gifted fantasizers who believe they were abducted by aliens for reproductive surgery. The evidence shows that many of the narratives each of us produce on a daily basis to explain how we feel, why we did something, or why we made a judgment that we made, are confabulations, mixtures of fact and fiction that we believe to be completely true. This research should give us pause. Many of us accuse others of making stuff up when they present arguments that are demonstrably full of false or questionable claims. But it's possible that people who make stuff up aren't even aware of it. They might really believe the falsehoods they utter. Studies on what is now called choice blindness demonstrate this point. Researchers showed males two pictures of female faces and asked them which one they found more attractive. The men were then asked why they chose the one they did. The photos were then turned face down and a trick was played on the subjects. One of the photos was turned over and sometimes the photo turned over was not the one the male selected. Yet in a majority of the trials the subject didn't even notice the switch and proceeded to provide details as to why he selected the one he didn't actually select. The majority of subjects are known to have confabulated, but it's possible that they all did. Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky are famous for having discovered that many of us answer an easier question than the one that is posed. These subjects were asked which female face they found more attractive. As far as I know, there was no attempt on the part of the researchers to discover what criteria the subjects would use to determine how they measure attractiveness in females. It is likely that most of us have no problem deciding whether we find a person attractive, but how many of us have ever reflected on the criteria we use in making that decision? If there is just one photo to look at, most of us would instantly decide whether the face is attractive. But will we know why we feel the way we do? Our brain must have gone through some sort of decision-making process in an instant. What data our brain was using to arouse our feelings is unknown to us at the moment we decide that the face is or isn't attractive. The same would be true for making a comparison between two faces. We might do it instantly, and there is no way we could be conscious of the criteria our brain is using to drive our feelings. So when asked why we find face A more attractive than face B, we make stuff up. For all we know, when asked which face is more attractive, we answer not that question, but another one such as, which girl would I want to kiss, or which girl looks friendlier, or which girl would be more likely to find me attractive. Yet, when we give our reasons for, for our choice to the experimenter, we may say things like, she has a lovely smile, her hairdo is very nice, she looks like she'd be fun to party with, she reminds me of some actress I like. The actual reasons for our choice may or may not coincide with what we say, and we usually have no way of knowing whether we're telling the truth even though we believe we are. We might state what we think a man should say when describing a woman as attractive, rather than state or even know why we really find one face more attractive than another. The researchers who did the study on face choices also did a study called Magic at the Marketplace, Choice Blindness for the Taste of Jam and the Smell of Tea. Many people had no problem explaining why they favored a jam, even though, when given a second taste of what they thought was the one they selected, it wasn't. Several other studies have found that confabulation is rather common among us ordinary folk who have not yet been diagnosed with a brain disorder. We can speculate as to why we confabulate. Perhaps we make up stories that seem plausible to us, even though we don't really have a clue as to their accuracy, for the same reason that Mr. Thompson did. We confabulate to make sense out of our experience, our feelings, our perceptions, and our memories. Unlike Mr. Thompson, though, most of us have brains that can access vast quantities of data in an instant. 
but these brain processes are taking place below the level of consciousness. We're often not really aware of why we're constructing the stories we do. It may be hard to believe, but the evidence is overwhelming that we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do. In future episodes, perhaps I'll touch on some related topics like self-deception and motivated reasoning. In the meantime, please commit some unnatural acts in public. And don't forget, skepticism, though unnatural, is a virtue. Remember about four episodes ago, back at the end of March? Well, I had a great conversation with Neil deGrasse Tyson. In that discussion, he described how small the budget for NASA really is, and that if NASA was given a full penny from each American tax dollar instead of the only half they get now, the wonderful things they can do, and how much further and faster along our journey into space would be. Well, I got a chance to talk with John Zeller, the founder of Penny for NASA, a group that wants to put pressure on the government officials to make them realize just how important the work that NASA does and the extreme benefits investing in planetary exploration science has had and will have if it's properly funded. So I'm here with John Zeller and... Anybody who heard me talk to Neil deGrasse Tyson a couple episodes ago, we talked about the whole budget of NASA being like if you hold up a penny and cut it in half and that was pretty much out of your dollar, that's how much money get that gets given to NASA. And he said if we could fix almost everything with NASA, with NASA and get even more bad value if we just went from a half a penny to a full penny. So John is here to tell us about what he's evolved with, which has something directly to do with that. Hey, thanks for having me on your show. Oh, no problem. I founded the website pennyfornasa.org. Um, about a month and a half ago, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, gave testimony to the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation during a session that they were having about the future of the United States space program. And, and he said most of the same things that you both talked about a couple episodes ago um, about how NASA's has huge economic benefit, huge technological benefit, and, and also a huge inspirational benefit to the, to the nation and the world as a whole, um, and that most Americans think that NASA has a budget of something like 20%, when in reality they have about half a penny, um, and that does not, or is not, um, that's not appropriate for an agency that gives so much uh, we should be funding and supporting that a lot more. So I've started this website, pennyfornasa.org. Our goal is to actually see this happen. Right now, NASA's budget's about 0.48%, or about $17.7 billion. What we would like to see happen as real tangible change, we want on the fiscal year 2014 budget that comes out um, next February in 2013, we want that to reflect an increase in NASA's budget to a full 1% of the U.S. annual budget, which is somewhere around 36 to $40 billion. Um, and that's 1%, but it's still double of what NASA has now. And that will enable NASA to do even more of the things that they've been doing. Um, a lot of people will ask, what type of benefit does NASA give? Why aren't we spending money down here when we're spending money up there? Things like that. Um, and I think that people underestimate the amount of economic benefit that, that we get from NASA and their research. Uh, for instance, just right when NASA first started, they started in 1958. So the funding that they had from 1958 to 1969 in 1958 dollars is about $25 billion. Um, according to a study in 1971, they found that through from 1958 to 1971, there was a benefit, a, a return on investment of about $52 billion. So that was already a 100% return on investment. And they had estimated at that time that through the next 18 years or 16 years, all the way through 1987, that they'd have a return of $181 billion off of that first $25 billion. How many other federal programs do you know that really give that type of an economic return and are also funded so little 
in, in the grand scheme of the U.S. budget. So that's kind of what we're, we're looking to try to change. Uh, our first goal, we have a petition on change.org, which you can find on our website at pennyfornasa.org. That, our first goal with that is to get more than 100,000 signatures. We feel that that will give a real voice to the message and make it pretty evident that, that there are a lot of Americans that are really, really on board with this. Um, and our next step past then is to do grassroots communication with our congressional representatives in Congress and let them know, hey, your constituents want this, and this is what needs to happen. And at that point, we'll start working with representatives that already agree that NASA's budget needs to be increased, start some real legislation, and then sign on those who don't agree. Um, ideally, the president will be on board, and that will be included in their proposal um, whoever it ends up being, either Romney or Obama, um, in, in 2013. Um, and, and we'd like to see that reflected in, in the fiscal year 2014 budget. What's really funny to me is that a lot of people forget that they make this a uh, partisan issue, but it really doesn't have to be that. If you want to contact your congressional rep, remind, if they're, let's say they're Republican, it doesn't matter because NASA gets so much benefit to the military as well. And people always forget that. I mean, the military uses the NASA satellite, satellites all the time. So a lot of people just, you know, just assume that, you know, one side or the other will be against it, but it really shouldn't be that way. And if this is something you feel strongly about, you can actually leverage that to your reps. And if we get enough people to do that, this could actually happen. Absolutely. And, I, and it does sound somewhat after school special to say, write your congressman. So many people are, are so, are so um, what's the word I'm looking for? So many people are burdened by the fact that, that maybe their, their congressional representatives don't want to listen to what they're saying or that their voice doesn't matter. But when it comes down to it, they really, really do listen to this kind of thing. Um, recently, I was speaking with someone about uh, the fact that Gabrielle Giffords during the del deliberations for the NASA budget cuts. And, and recently, NASA did see some budget cuts. Planetary science saw a huge cut. I think it went from $800 million to about $500 million. Um, she received 10 letters on the entire issue. Contrast that with during health care, which a lot of people also cared about. Uh, she received somewhere around 10,000 wow. letters. So that, that kind of contrasts the issue. If, if you're not speaking out about it, how are you expecting that that kind of thing is going to change? Uh, her husband, Mark Kelly, during a recent uh, conference, when he was asked about, well, what's the future for our space program? Why aren't we moving forward in these things? Why aren't we doing all these things that we're dreaming of? And he said he gave somewhat of an ominous comment that basically said, you know, the United States public has the space program that they want to have right now. Well, that's true if they don't speak up. Sure, exactly. I, I, I completely agree with that. I think that what he was trying to say, or what he was trying to present, rather, is more of a challenge rather than a bleak outlook. What he's trying to say is, you're saying that you want these things. You're saying that you want to support such an amazing, amazing agency, but you're not willing to put in the time to actually tell your elected representatives. Let us remind you, these are elected representatives. These are, these are employees of... America. These are these are people that you can fire if they're not doing their job. And if you don't voice your opinion, that won't happen. And and so I think that what, what Mark Kelly was trying to say was was that we have the space program that we want because we're not speaking out about changing it. And I think I've talked to enough people myself to know that there are enough people in the United States that if we spoke out about this all at the same time, these kinds of things would change and we wouldn't be speaking about this anymore in hushed tones and, and not actually talking out about this. So, Yeah, it always fr frustrates me when people don't or just don't realize that everybody in the government is your employee here in America. If you don't like them, fire them. If, so, if they're not doing something you, you want them to do, you have to tell them. If you went to the, your job every day and you never got any feedback from your boss, what would you be doing? Probably you know, playing solitaire or you know, surfing the web. It's the same thing. Absolutely, absolutely. I completely agree. And I think that that can make it seem like somewhat of a daunting task, too, because you by yourself, you think, 
oh, my letter's not going to change anything. And I think one of the great things about this campaign is that, so after Neil deGrasse Tyson spoke at that, at that Senate committee, I noticed on all types of social networks, hashtag penny for NASA. And it was going all over the place. Some people had put together a lot of different videos. Those were getting shared. And for the first time, I started seeing a real reemergence of this conversation in, in the public medium. Um, and so that's where pennyfornasa.org came in to try to centralize this voice and let people know that we're all in this together. And if we speak at the same time, we can actually have real change happen. Um, and I think that that should act as somewhat of a reassurance to anybody who cares about this issue because it's not just you that's speaking out. It's going to be everybody at the same time, but we all have to work on it together. It's very true. Now, on your website, you have a lot of good information. You have some videos, and you have a bunch of education uh, bits and bobs. It's, I thought that was really, really good because a lot of people have friends or family that might not realize how important it is, and they don't realize how to say or what they want to say or if there's information or statistics they want that's all on the website as well. And they have you have ways to get to you, find your own congressman and things like that. So uh, that is na penny for NASA dot org, and the four is the number four. Yes. Yeah. And uh, is there anything else that people should know? Yeah. Uh, go to the website. Educate yourself. Uh, we have a few things that we'd like people to do. First, sign the petition. Then share it with anybody that you think cares, and those that don't care, because when it comes down to it we've got to change people's minds about this. The more we talk about it, the more we start a national conversation, the more these things get into the public eye, we will actually start to get attention for these things. Um, so like I said, go sign the petition. An easy way to get there is pennyfornasaorg slash petition, and that'll redirect you to our petition. Um, and again, as, as Derek said, it's penny, the number four, nasa.org. <laughs> So remember to check out the show notes so you can go and read about how to get involved with the future of science through the exploration of the cosmos. So our newest regular segment has been creating some feedback. Hopefully you are one of the folks who has become a fan of The Odds Must Be Crazy. Well, Wendy and Jarrett and the crew over at their website have another story to share. And this time, they got some help from another one of our friends, Brian Keith Dalton, otherwise known as Mr. Dady. Welcome to The Odds Must Be Crazy on Skepticality, where we talk about the crazy things that happen to you every day in the third person, awkwardly, like you're not even standing right in front of us. I'm Jarrett Kaufman. And I'm Wendy Hughes, and we'll be your skippers through the thoroughly trademarked theme park jungle cruise of probability. Hi, Wendy. What story have you chosen for skepticality today? Hi, Jarrett. Today's story was submitted to us by blog reader Daniel S. It can be found on our blog today by searching for Paying It Forward by the Side of the Road, also linked to in the show notes. Daniel's tender and amazing story begins. I hurt my back on Monday. Nothing severe, just have to stay in bed and take muscle relaxers for a couple of days. I'm not sure exactly how I did it because the pain wasn't instant. It just got worse as the day progressed until I couldn't get out of bed Tuesday morning. I'm pretty sure I heard it that morning when I stopped to change a tire for a little old lady who had a blowout on the side of the interstate. She was very sweet and thankful and said that normally her husband would have come to help her, but he was out of state. She offered me money, but I wouldn't accept it. I just told her to remember to be nice to others. Fast forward to today. I got a call from my mom about an hour ago that she has had a blowout on the interstate, and it's pretty close to the same place that I had stopped to help the lady on Monday. I feel helpless because I can't get up to go help her, so I tell her that if she can't get a change to call me back, and I will start calling friends who may be near her. About half an hour goes by, and she calls me back. She got the lug nuts off, but the tire wouldn't budge. It was stuck on. Just then, a little old man pulled up and asked her if she needed help. He got a hammer out of his pickup and got the tire off for her and changed it. 
She offered him money, but he wouldn't accept. He said that his wife had a blowout around the same place two days ago, and he was out of town and felt helpless that he couldn't come help her. He said that she told him that someone stopped and changed the tire for her and wouldn't accept money, but told her to be nice to others, and he was just paying it forward. This story of ships passing in the night, a seemingly impossible coincidence of people who don't know each other, but who indirectly shared an experience crossing paths twice, seems improbable. But it's our job to take a machete to the vegetation of confusion and cast a light on the mixed metaphor of perspective. So with that in mind, our friend and probability heavy lifter, Barbara Drescher, shared her thoughts with us, which we'll trim and paraphrase for you here to keep from droning on too long. But we recommend viewing the story on the site for her unedited contribution. Barbara says, Pro-social behavior has been a topic of intense study by psychologists since modern psychology began, and it continues today because it is much more complicated than people think. We tend to view the behavior of others as driven by personal values and personality, yet this view is mostly inaccurate. One early finding is that people are more likely to take responsibility for the welfare of others, or even for another's property, if they are simply asked to do so. Recent research suggests that a large part of the effect can be attributed simply to the fact that a pro-social attitude is easily accessed when we are reminded. In this case, the author specifically asked the woman he helped to pay it forward. The added feeling of gratitude and debt that she felt was certainly a factor, but the effect of noting that she could do the same for someone else is not insignificant. Barbara further explains that this sort of behavior is contagious, like smiling at people who first smile at us. This is often how the basic principles of the secret get perpetuated. As while they rely on supernatural explanations that can't be backed up by science, there's a kernel of truth in the way people's behavior can affect those around them. It won't help you win a sweepstakes, make your cooking delicious, or ensure your favorite curling team wins the tournament. Hi, Canadian listeners! But helping others without expecting anything in return and trusting that others will do the same helps bolster this for everyone. So outside of the social behavior aspects, we're still left with some statistically interesting elements to consider, with a shorter list than one might think. First, what is the probability that the author's mother would have a blowout within a few days of the first event? The probability of getting a flat tire is relatively small in modern times in comparison to 30 years ago, but it happens. It's rare enough that the probability is mired in enough factors to make it difficult to calculate. For example, if you drive a lot, you have more opportunities to get a flat tire, but you are less likely to allow those tires to wear down to unsafe tread depths. Where you drive is a factor as well. If these two women were the victims of flats this close together, perhaps there is a large amount of sharp debris in this roadway, increasing everyone's chance of getting a flat tire. The answers to the next two questions to consider are intertwined. What's the probability that this would occur in the same general area? And what's the probability that the woman's husband would be driving in the same general area at the same time? You might be thinking that the question of whether the husband would stop to help is also a factor. But Barbara argues that it is insignificant. The location and likelihood of a flat are tied together for other reasons as well. The author of the post clearly lives close enough to where his mother's flat occurred that he could have helped if he had not been injured. Although humans may travel great distances, the majority of us live most of our daily lives within a relatively small home range. The fact that most accidents occur in the home is not due to our homes being unsafe, but simply due to the amount of time we spend there. Likewise, the probability that the woman's husband was driving in the same general area is not exactly low, nor is the probability that he was driving at that time. The fact is that humans share enough of a pattern of activity that we can predict the flow of traffic fairly well and make reasonable assumptions about the operating hours of businesses. So with everything Barbara considered, we're left with behavioral elements to explain why the husband stopped and some statistical elements and a few unknown factors to raise the odds of both tires popping in the same area and the people involved being in the right place at the right time. But what all of that analysis fails to pop is this. The story is really sweet. It touches that soft spot in all of us that hopes for the best in humanity. And no matter how much research can explain why we act the way we do, and what events are likely to occur in what order and what circumstance, Understanding it doesn't prevent us from smiling when we hear about people doing good deeds for one another. And maybe for exactly the sorts of reasons we just outlined, we'll use this story as an example to stop for someone else in need in the side of the road, even if we just use up one of our AAA benefits instead of getting our hands dirty. Thanks for listening to The Odds Must Be Crazy on Skepticality. 
please be sure to visit theoddsmustbecrazy.com and share your comments, preferably without the caps lock key engaged. Also, be sure to follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, circle us on Google+, and validate us in life. Hit the Submit a Story link on our site and share your own crazy stories, or tweet the short ones with the hashtag T-O-M-B-C. The Odds Must Be Crazy is a project in collaboration with the Independent Investigations Group in Los Angeles, California. Visit them at iigwest.org. Barbara Drescher is a contributing editor to our blog and can also be found at icbseverywhere.com. Our theme music comes to us courtesy of Mr. Deity himself, Brian Keith Dalton. You can find him at mrdeity.com. And until next time, remember, if you find yourself on the side of the road with a missing chunk of time, odds are it wasn't aliens. You just needed more coffee. Thanks again, Wendy, Jared, and Brian. Maybe some of you remember the tragic events which unfolded in Rancho Santa Fe, California, in March 1997. It was the largest mass suicide on United States soil. 39 people took their own lives in an attempt to reach the next level. Those people were all part of the Heaven's Gate cult. What many people might not know or remember is that there were many other groups and individuals who, on their own, performed ritualistic suicides at the same time around the country. One of these was Jimmy, the brother of our next guest, Deb Simpson. Deb recently published her book, Closing the Gate, a deeply personal look into her brother and the story of one member of the Heaven's Gate cult and how they were seduced into the group and how their family has dealt with the aftermath of the event. So, have you on today to talk about your newest book, Closing the Gate, and this is a really highly personal book about your brother and has fallen to a, a cult. However, this is not your first book. What is your typical subject matter in, in your writings? Um, I write in a lot of different genres. So I have a children's book and have a couple of other things, but actually it all comes back to my core belief that the first five years of life really form the foundation for the future. So what happens to us in the first five years and the resources that we get often direct or enable our decisions when we become adults. So my actual, my first book was my story. Um, This one is my brother's story. And my story was one moment, one memory, one motion, which is really told in poetic form. And it goes into much more about how I came through it and how important my grandmother's presence in the first five years of my life were. So I'm kind of all over the map with genres, <laughs> but that's my core. So you have a couple of kids' books, and you have a book of poetry? I do, and I have a guidebook. Yeah, and I, that's kind of kind of what you do and work based on your resume, I think, as well, right? Actually, what I do for professionally is I am a quality systems manager for a medical device company. I've been in medical device and pharma for 20 years and quality systems people are kind of, we're kind of the navigators and the coaches. We work with regulatory regulations, FDA regulations, ISO standards, pulling all that into writing procedures. So it certainly comes into writing also interpreting them and kind of working with manufacturing to get those rules incorporated into a process that actually works. So we are kind of seen as we're kind of the people that are all over the place. Pretty much what my wife does as well for the company (laughs) she works for, so I understand that completely. So this book is more about your brother, unlike your previous books, which are either about poetry or stuff that you've done yourself. So this is much different. Was this, was this your first interest you've ever had in this topic before? Um, I have done a lot of research around this and a lot of like exploration because I wanted to know. One of, the, one of the things that you'll see in the book is that Jimmy, my brother, actually spent time with me after he left the cult for a while. And even though he was trying to get back to the cult and ultimately followed them into suicide because of his beliefs, Um, I had the opportunity because of the time he spent with me and his letters and things like that to really learn a lot about how he became involved with the cult and how 
personally positive it had been for him in many ways. And that, to me, kind of fueled a whole desire to want to know more about the cult and become connected to members that are still out there, and there are still plenty out there. Now, because we haven't really said it yet, we're talking about the Heaven's Gate cult in particular, right? We are. Heaven's Gate, for most people, may not know that this cult was actually in existence more than 20 years and had more than 200 members during that time, and many of them are still around and still teaching or talking about the doctrine. Yeah, and it was a very, it's a very weird uh, hybrid of, of beliefs here because it's a pseudo-Christian and semi-sci-fi type cult. It absolutely is. They have their own, like many cults do, they have their own language and what they call things, but they were avid Trekkies. They watched all of the Star Trek series as a group. Uh, They read everything about them. They truly believed in UFOs. A lot of the people came to the cult because of their beliefs in UFOs and because they were seeking something. Um, And so they had kind of a hybrid of Raelian type things going on, a lot of pieces of other cults, uh, a little bit of biblical. I mean, they certainly had elements of the Bible in there, and Doe believed he was Jesus reincarnate, uh, and so did the people who still follow the cult uh, beliefs and so forth. So it was a very strange mixture. I don't think there's been anyone quite like this group in regard to the fact that their beliefs were they followed many of the same patterns of other cults in the way that they managed their members, but the way that they drew them in really formulated a lot around the UFO beliefs. Yeah, I did a bunch of research on Heaven's Gate cult again because I remember when I first moved here to Atlanta, that's when the mass suicides happened. And um, it actually happened in two waves, and a lot of people didn't really realize that. Right. The primary wave was the 39, and that's what most people heard about. Um, And so that was the mass suicide, and it still remains the largest mass suicide on U.S. soil, and I hope there's never anything bigger than that. There was plenty of people to lose in one one sitting on our own soil. Um, But in addition to that, there were two other members that followed shortly thereafter that were publicized, but there were other members like my brother that were not publicized. Yeah, and that was um, due to the fact that the police thought there might be copycats? Yes, that's and actually he was in Atlanta. That's where he took his own life. And it was the Atlanta police in Fulton County who said, uh, I said, is this going to be in the news? Because I was trying to understand where things were. And they said, because we were still hearing about the other members um, who were following. And they said, no, we're going to withhold this because we're very concerned. There have already been a couple of followers. We're concerned there will be copycats and there will be other people who will jump in behind this. So we're going to start restricting what we say. Now, did they ever release that information or it was just kind of swept under and then forgotten about after the news cycle got rid of the Heaven's Gate um, story? Uh, Jimmy's death was never reported to the media. So the first time it's been reported to the media is in the book. Um, The family, of course, knew, but it was never released by the the police department in Atlanta at all. They held it very close. There was an official case file and all of that, but... Do you know of any other people that the news never talked about, or is that the same problem where they just didn't talk about it, so there might be more? There could be more... uh, Carl Odi, who does a section, who does a commentary in this book, I know him as Jason, but his cult name is Carl Odi, um, who also knew my brother and talks, a lot, talks in this one section about that. He, all, he indicated there was at least one other person that they know of. Mm. But they're very close with that information, so they don't give it up very easily. Yeah. So, you know, before we get too far down the path, I think, like me, had to go back and do more research about the Heaven's Gate cult because I kind of forgot about it a little bit because it's been a while. I kind of surprised how long it's been because I remember how big of a story it was because it was like the year I moved here. And uh, so going back, you know, in in time, it's kind of 
you know, hard to do that. So let's talk a little bit about who the Heaven's Gate cult really was, or they still kind of are out there. And uh, I started with uh, Marshall Applewhite and his was his, her was she her his wife Bonnie Nettles or no no in fact they were one of the one of the core beliefs of this cult that is different than others is celibacy absolute celibacy so there were no male female relationships in fact when they discovered the bodies originally they thought all were male until they started to do the autopsies and realize that they had a mixture oh because they actually all dressed the same dressed the same their haircuts were the same there was no makeup. There was nothing to distinguish them at all um, until you started to, you know, get into the obvious autopsy situation. So Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles, or Marshall Applewhite was known as Doe, and Bonnie Nettles was known as T. And if you think of Do Re Mi Fa So La T, yeah, <laughs> because uh, Doe was a former music major and music teacher, and in fact, he also was a singer. Oh. in his past life. And there's there's some discussion that this may not be true, but most of the books out there, including a recent book that was done in the UK um, by George, I'll have to, Chrysides, I mean, I have his name correctly. Um, but, we're, but so they're actually doing more of a look at it from, from an intellectual, from a standpoint of a scholastic approach. Uh, most of the books commonly agree that that Doe and T met when Doe was in a mental institution. He was struggling with his sexuality, thinking that he could be gay. He'd been actually fired from one job because of an affair with a male student. And this is supposedly when they met. Some of the members that are still out there dispute that, but that's pretty much what's documented. And so they got acquainted through that, and then they connected on their new age beliefs and then they began to communicate with each other and they basically he had already left his family she left her family they got together and they became first known as the two uh, and there's actually a 1980s movie about them <laughs> which is a strange little movie it's one of those kind of you know one of those that you know is low budget kind of things. <laughs> and that happened long before the cult really formed, though, right? Right. But they came in the news in the 70s, their first public meeting in Walport, Oregon in 1975, which is a little town in Walport on the coast. Uh, was so They recruited so many people from that town and so many people followed them into the desert when they left that the FBI became involved. And so at that point, they were open with their beliefs but very quickly there they went underground because they were concerned the FBI was chasing them. And that was the late 70s, early 80s? It was in the 75 to 77 range, and okay. then they went underground until, the until 1993. That's when they resurfaced. One thing I was going to get into, because kind of when they came back above ground, I guess, it was right around the time when the Internet came into fruition with websites, because that's kind of what their business was, right? Absolutely. And they had a lot of people, a lot of the cult members were actually highly educated and kind of in the forefront of the web development pieces. I mean, they were, they really grabbed hold of this technology. They're probably the first cult to do that, although there's no absolute guarantee to that, but they seem to have been one of the first ones to use this as a medium. Yeah, and they, and they had that, it's a very bizarre look at how they used the Bible because they thought the book of Revelation and the Gospels were all referring to alien and UFO visitation, and that was kind of what they based their core beliefs on? Absolutely, absolutely, and that's where they connected with many, many of the members and where their belief that they were the two came from. Yeah, it's funny because I was when I went back and learned again some of the things. It was kind of funny because it makes more sense thinking that uh, Marshall Applewhite might have been struggling with the fact that he was gay because he claimed uh, Bonnie as the heavenly father, and I thought that was funny because she's the female, but in his mind, I guess, ever to his male, I guess. Um, actually, they saw no difference. They, so the, they believed that the physical human body was completely irrelevant 
and the only thing that mattered was the soul. And when you moved into the next level, our closest equivalent to that would be heaven. Um, but it would be a UFO type, uh, another world. Uh, at the next level, then they believed that we, everyone would be the same and we would basically look like the aliens that we actually picture a great deal, about, about the size of a child, you know, third grade child or so, and kind of light blue and eerie looking. Oh, like the, uh, I guess the UFO people like to call them the grays. Right. <laughs> yeah, the big eyes and the, and the big head and the small neck. Right, so they thought the, that your sexuality was completely unimportant and was one of those human things that they needed to just do away with and forget about. Because their belief system was much like, uh, I guess, the movie Avatar, because you could move your soul from one, one person to another and they just disuse bodies. Yes, except that they couldn't actually, I think they believed that, but they couldn't do it without killing the body. And oh, yeah, that gets, leads us to hence why they were a suicide cult, even though I guess some of the members don't consider that suicide. They don't consider it suicide. They consider that freeing because they consider that a, a, a funny thing about uh, our particular human bodies that we can't release the soul except through death. And so killing the body or the vessel, as they called it, to free the soul was not seen as suicide. It was actually seen as kind of a heavenly release. Now, you have a part of this book that you that was written by one of the people who were was a former member or possibly still a member. I couldn't figure, really parse right. that out because um, he kind of makes it, I guess, kind of pro Heaven's Gate. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And is he is he still a member? Because he's he has a little not a, I wouldn't call it a chapter, but a, a decent chunk of the book where he had his own views. You put in there for to, that to show how they think. Yes, and I, I specifically wanted to do that because I wanted everyone to have a different opinion. I mean, I certainly have my opinion, and I couldn't see myself becoming involved in this. But I do know that my brother loved these people, uh, and so I try to remember that when I'm talking with them. And Jason, or Carlotti, who contributed this section, a kind of a commentary section, uh, I wanted him to have pretty much free reign to say what he was thinking and his memory and, and where things were, and that's what he does. He is still out there. He was actually trying to, he had left the cult, believing that he needed to go and do something, and then decided that he really wanted to go back to them, that that's really where he belonged. But the mass suicide occurred before he could get back to them. And so he really still absolutely believes. He runs a couple of blogs that talk about his belief. He's very well connected to Sawyer, who runs a blog, blog talk radio show. Sawyer was part of the group for 19 years. And they both firmly still believe in the doctrine of the cult. So technically they're just all still part of it, but they don't claim it? They still claim it. They're just not united in one place, and they're not living together. But there are at least a half dozen who are actively teaching the cult's beliefs. And does, do you have any idea how many people out there are still following the Heaven's Gate mantra? I don't have a number. Again, a lot of this is kind of underground one-on-one, -on -one, and they're, they're kind of paranoid about people finding out. Um, so they're very guard, guarded with that. I can tell you from interactions on Facebook and things like that that I know of at least two people who, have, who are pretty adamantly out there talking about the cult who are new converts. The people that are still, I guess, following it, they are still producing DVDs and books, and they have a Facebook group and all these things. I guess and YouTube. Yeah. They're on YouTube, heavily on YouTube. It's funny because it's one of those, I mean, I think everybody that's listening to this probably remembers the Heaven's Gate um, suicide, but I don't think a lot of people realize that they're still out there trying to push things online. And, you know, it's funny because I didn't think about it really. And then I went, after, when I was read the book, I just went online. It's like, once you actually want to look for it, it's everywhere. Yes. It's amazing 
that it is everywhere. And you, it's amazing that we don't hear more about it, especially with the 15th anniversary having just passed. The 15th yeah. anniversary of the mass suicide um, just occurred in March. And so it's, it's hard still to get information. There's a lot of information out there about the cult. And there's a lot of public information, but then digging down into some of the other people that have been members in the past and trying to find out where they are today, or to even connect what we would call their real names with their cult names is difficult. Yeah, and you mentioned, uh, we talked a little bit about the, it was Jason that did the little blurb in the book that's still a follower, pseudo follower of the, of the cult. And he believes that he was left behind. He didn't join everybody else in the, in the. Uh, I, I guess I. It is a suicide to us, but I guess they don't consider that. But he believes he was left behind to carry on the the mesh of the group and to keep people believing in the in the truth. Absolutely, he believes that, as does Sawyer. Um, I think Rio, who is probably the mo- the one everyone remembers, who was on all the talk shows after the mass suicide occurred. So you've got at least three pretty public figures from the cult who are all saying, we are here for a reason. We wish we had been with our, they call them the class. We wish we had been with our class members, but we're here to make sure that other people know this so that when the next harvest comes, there will be the people who are supposed to be part of this will know about it. Yeah, as I say that I always found, I found that, Oddly and very creepy that they call it the harvest. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's what the event was, where they everybody, you know, took their own life back in the in the what was it ninety six ninety seven? It was ninety seven. Yeah. Yes. It was March of ninety seven, and they when they when they became public again in ninety three, their messages all start with something close to the earth is about to be recycled. And the harvest is about to occur. So they were just being green? That's right. <laughs> I don't think they thought of it that way. <laughs> Had to make it a little bit lighter, I guess. <laughs> right? <laughs> this is a very fascinating thing, I think, for a lot of people. A lot of skeptics, you know, that word cult gets bannered about like quite a bit. And the thing is, what were the, I mean, when did you realize that your brother was in a cult? I'd say I realized it pretty quickly after he left. After he, he left a letter stating that he was joining a monastery. And almost immediately, I, didn't, I lived in Illinois at that point, and I was on the phone with my mother talking through this, and I was asking her questions like, okay, what did he take with him? What did he not take with him? Did he take money? And when we discovered that he had cleaned out his entire account, well over $6,000, uh, and closed all the accounts, and he had taken a list of what he took, and then I looked at the, the information he had left for my mother. She sent me a copy, and I looked at the information, and there was no return address. And when I tried to get information, I could not get a return address for what was then called the Transfiguration Monastery for Renunciants in Readiness for the Kingdom of Heaven. Well, I guess Heaven's <laughs> Gate was a much shorter name. <laughs> they went through several. They had several names over the years. Um, Total Overcomers, the UFO Cult, which was kind of an obvious one, and ultimately <laughs> Heaven's Gate. Um, so I was pretty quickly alerted to the fact that it could be a cult and started to try to reach people like with the Salvation Army and other entities who, in 97, um, were trying to find out about them. And they'd never heard of this cult. It had been in existence all that time, but it had been underground and had just resurfaced and hadn't come up on their radar yet. And by the time it did, it was pretty much over. Yeah, and that, well, they had like five or six different names over the course of their 20-something years before the... The, uh, the harvest. Yes, they did. And they moved around, too. That's the other thing people may not know, is they often broke up in groups of anywhere from 10 to 40, depending how large the group was that they had at that time. Uh, and they broke up into small groups, and they moved around the country independently. Uh, so it wasn't like they were all sitting in one place where you could physically see them, because they really weren't doing that most of the time. 
the buzzword that I thought was kind of creepy was the it's another day in the hologram. <laughs> yeah. That was it really yeah. that was like one of the things that the people who were in that group used to say before they had to be called away. That was kind of the part of their dialect, their language. They used a lot of Star Trek kind of language. Um, but not just Star Trek. That's just one of the things. But in the section that Jason wrote, Carlotti, he talks about the fact that when he first came in, my brother was already a member at that point, and he comments on the fact that Jimmy, my brother, said to him, well, it's just another day in the hologram, and he would learn that that was a very common thing to use that kind of language, meaning that it's all surreal, nothing is real, we're not where we belong, we have to be harvested or transplanted to get where we belong. These are things that, to look out for if you have uh, family members who seem to be acting weird. Absolutely. Um, initially, I mean, part of it, like many other cults, they were told they needed to pull away. As And the, the example they used was really the disciples pulled away to follow Jesus, and that's how they explained it. That's how my brother explained it in his letter. Um, so they believed that they needed to pull away from all family and friends, and that's one of the warning signs. If you're asked to do that, if one of your family members is asked to do that, you're basically removing all of their support, all of their support systems. So they're, they really don't have then anyone to go to outside of that group or that cult that are really driving and reinforcing all of those beliefs. So they're basically replacing the beliefs you had with their beliefs, and there's no one there to challenge that. What I found very interesting is that there was a clinical autopsy of yes. of of, uh, of Jimmy, and so I guess he might have had a personality disorder. Well, did he find that through the uh, autopsy? Oh no no no! That's what I clinical... figured. It's like, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> is that some new technology I didn't know about? <laughs> uh, it would be nice, right? A nice science fiction slide. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, no, this happens. Um, she is a, a licensed mental health counselor, Monica Devine. Um, and fairly, you know, she's been doing this for a very long time. But she had a lot of knowledge about Jimmy, and she had met him, and she also has a, knowledge, a lot of knowledge about my family and my background and Jimmy's background because we've known her for many, many years. And so she used her background in the family along with her clinical expertise as a licensed mental health counselor to look back at all the pieces and basically do an autopsy that was like looking back at the history, a historical review of all the clinical information around mental health. And so looking at the fact that our mother was schizophrenic and Jimmy's father, because we had different fathers, Jimmy's father was a sociopath. And those are both diagnosed mental illnesses that are in their records. Um, so she had that as a foundation. She had a lot of the family history to go with that, and she then put together, based on her clinical expertise, that she believed he had a personality disorder that's related to many children of, of schizophrenics. Ah, see, so it was more like a uh, uh, behavioral an analysis after the fact. Correct. Ah, okay. That's a very simple way of saying it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll I, have to remember that. <laughs> well, you know, I consider it, you know, if you think about it in the way that... Uh, the FBI uses to like track down serial killers when they have no evidence other than their pattern. Right. That's, yes, and that's kind of, kind of what it is. It's behavioral analysis post-mortem. <laughs> <laughs> so I noticed this is a, uh, is this a book self-published? It is published by a small press. Okay. Uh, and and uh, the press is Piney D Press. It's located here in Tennessee. Um, at this point, they are pretty much publishing just me and a couple of other here and there kind of things. So it does kind of have that appearance. <laughs> now, can people find all of your books like on places like Amazon? They absolutely can. They're on Amazon. They're on Barnes & Noble. They're pretty much on all the online stores. And in Middle Tennessee, they're in most of the bookstores as well. You can also buy them from my website, um, there, you know, there's an op there are plenty of options. They're out there everywhere, but I have an Amazon author page, so you can see all of them in one place. And the companion book, for those who might read Closing the Gate and would like to know the other, like how did one, how did one sibling end up 
taking their own life through a cult. And the other one who came up in this family, too, ended up ha actually having a fairly successful life, you know, a marriage, a child, you know, kind of a normal, if you will, <laughs> professional <laughs> career uh, kind of path. And really, one moment, one memory, one motion is my story that kind of pulls the other piece in. And when that goes further, I think, to the point that he might have had some form of mental, mental disorder because it seems like the family itself seemed to be okay. I mean, as far as like, you know, your, you turned out fine. So I guess, you know, there might have been something that triggered in his brain that made him go this direction. My belief, and at this point, I don't think anyone can concretely prove this, although there's lots of psychological evidence out there. Um, I believe that the first five years made all the difference. Although there are some differences in, you know, we have different fathers. We really were raised in pretty much the same thing most of our lives. But the first five years of my life, I lived with my grandmother. My mother, our mother, and my father had been, had split up. And my mother was young, and she was wanting to do the young thing <laughs> and all that. Um, and so I lived with my grandmother on her farm until I was five. So I had an up upbringing where not only did I learn to read early, but I was in an environment that was safe. I could run and play. I had absolute unconditional love. I'm not telling you there wasn't discipline. There was, but there was <laughs> unconditional love. Oh, you're on a farm. I worked on a farm <laughs> when right. I was in high school. So, yes, I know. You had, you had this discipline, at least. <laughs> but you, I also had, you know, I had a spirituality. I wouldn't say religion. Although my grandmother did go to church, really it was about the spirituality, the connection with the trees. It was more of, of what you might find in, an, in a Cherokee Indian nation, that kind of spirituality, uh, a real connection with the earth. And I gained all of that from her and having a home. I had a central place to live, a home. And consistency, you know, things that people often take for granted, you know, meals at a regular time and a place to sleep. Jimmy really didn't have that. He grew up with our mother, who was schizophrenic, and his father, who was a sociopath, and we constantly moved. He was moved from, I counted it, it's, I said it somewhere in the book, but I want to say it was around eight different states in like 12 different cities and 18 different places in the first five years of his life. He was not around any family. We were not around Atlanta, which is where my mother's family was. Um, he did not grow up with that, so we were constantly on the move. And then when he was three and a half, his father went to prison for molesting me. And our mother had a complete mental breakdown and ended up in a mental institution. We went to live with an aunt that he didn't know. So his only stability at that point was me, and I was 12. So he really did not have that foundation that he needed, and I think he was always looking for then he, in, and I guess he joined this cult off of the, uh, as they put in places like USA Today and magazines and things like that. Yes, he did. He learned about it in USA Today. Just happened to pick it up and read their full page ad that described what they were looking for. Started a dialogue with them through the mail and ended up joining them, having never met any of them, just communicating through the mail and I think once or twice on the phone. Um, and and it was such a powerful connection for him. One of the former members that has resurfaced, has gotten in contact with me since the book was published, um, who is not one of their supporters, he left the cult because he came to an awareness that this was not truth for him. Yeah. <laughs> um, he has said to me a couple of times uh, on various emails and, and on Facebook that the thing he needs to remember, he, he was older, and he said the thing is, I watched your brother. Your brother was a really nice guy, really genuinely nice person. And he said he was looking for a family. I could see that, and he mentioned it several times, that that's what he really wanted was a family. And the cult to him was the family he never really had. And I think I've, I've heard that in the past from so many people who talk about the warning signs of, of cults where that's way – that's the best way that they can find new members. Yes, I'd say that's absolutely true. There, Someone is seeking every single, a couple of the former members did a DVD, and on that DVD, I can't recall the title, 
But on this DVD, one of the members who'd been part of it for about 15 years and then left said that every single person who was involved in this group was a seeker. They were all looking for something. And so it was a matter of putting out a message that they connected with, and then they were drawn to it like bees to honey. Wow. I suggest reading the book because it is very personal, but yet it really hits home as far as what the effect of things like these types of groups and cults can have on a family. I mean, because it's pretty, per, it's very personal, the book. It is personal, um, and I wanted everyone to be able to experience, when they read the book, to be able to experience what Jimmy experienced and to get to know the people that he grew up with and lived with that influenced what he became. Um, and so I really tried to take the walls down, if you will, and, and let people into that family. And I have to say that the writers group that I'm part of was an instrumental help in that because they really listened to this thing through several iterations and <laughs> gave lots of feedback uh, and ideas about where things weren't connecting and things like that. So uh, I'm forever grateful for them, and I think that it's a story that needs to be told, although not always a story that's easy to tell. No, because I think uh, the past things I've read on this cult in particular and others, they've all mainly been more clinical in a way they've been mm -hmm. just you know the very factual information about what happened which i find fascinating but i've not really met read one like this where it really is showing the per a person that was involved and what really effect it had around the people who were his family and the people who loved him i think that's true i did a, i've done many many searches for books about heaven's gate specifically and DVDs, and I've also talked with some of the former members on Facebook and things like that. Um, there is one other book written by a cult member that was written by Rio, and I actually used his as some of the reference material and just verifying some of the things I had learned from my brother about terms they used. But again, it's pretty much a factual, this happened, this happened, this happened kind of thing. Um, to my knowledge, there are no other former members or family members who have written about this. And where can people find your website? My website is really pretty easy. My name is Deb Simpson, and the website is debsimpsonbooks.com. So, so if you search it or you search Closing the Gate, which really refers to my brother closing the gate on life or closing his options when he became involved with Heaven's Gate, um, that's the title of the book, and I would love to hear any comments that anyone has. Yeah, and like I said, if they find you on your website, they can probably send you an email if they had anything to ask or share if they have personal experiences that might be similar. Absolutely, absolutely, and that has happened a few times. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, all of those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty easy to find. What's your, what's your Twitter handle? <laughs> it's actually Debbie Sim. Okay. But if you go to the website, they're all connected on the front page. All of the social icons are there. You can just hit it and go straight to my page. Great. Thank you so much for sharing some of your information and uh, for this book. I think it's really a good thing for other people to read, especially if they're very interested in things like cults and especially the mentality of people who get involved with things like this. Thank you so much, Derek. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed talking to you and... I've had a great time getting to know you over email. It's nice to connect the voice. <laughs> no problem at all. I sincerely thank Deb for coming on our show to share her story and allowing us all to get a better look at how some of the inner workings of a dangerous group like Heaven's Gate actually operates. And not to mention the quite personal nature of her story and how it's affected her and her family. As always, if you want more information about anything you've heard in this episode, please go over to our website and check out the show notes. There you'll find links to all sorts of information over at skepticality.com. Hungry for more skepticism? 
Want to learn the truth about the scientific controversies of our time? Then subscribe.